engineers. Oh. Okay, call the meeting back to order at 6.42. Let me grab my agenda. <coughs> okay, it's first meeting on the agenda, public input. Is there anybody that has any matters discussed that is not are not on the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move on. There is no student report tonight. So we'll go to the new business. Amy Luckowitz. We're starting ADHD. Oh, We're getting the, uh, fun. Oh, did Rich not make it down here? <laughs> I didn't even notice Rich wasn't there, sorry. Do you think the copy of the slides are not pretty? They're in black and white. But are they the same thing that was in our packet? Yeah. I think we, we all have them. Okay. You want to sit down? Yeah. In case you wanted to add them. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Try not to sneeze on it anymore. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Hi. Good Hello. to see you. Good to see you. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, we just start? No, I said I didn't realize Rich wasn't here when I called the order. Sorry. You're on vacation? Go ahead. All set? Yes. Well, hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Good to, I don't think I've met everybody. So I'm Amy. Hi. Chris. Good to meet you. And I don't think we've met officially. I've seen Diana. you. Yes. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so today we're just going to go through our um, uh, revised report. So I think you have the most current copy. But um, if you remember the survey that you all approved, we call it the core measurement survey. This is a survey that we take annually as part of our requirement for the Federal Drug Free Communities Grant. Um, this survey and the one that you approved includes behavioral questions, but you're not going to see that in the report tonight. It, there were about 38 questions, so what you're seeing is just what we call the core measurement. And these are the questions that the federal government kind of, for lack of a better term, grades us on to see if we are moving in the trend of decreased use. And specifically, um, grades uh, middle school through high school, so they don't really have us take any measurements for elementary school, of course. And it's really related to the past 30 day use, so we're going to focus mostly on that. So every year, uh, oh, sorry, here's the answer. The sample population, how many responses that we had, is on your page two. But our goals don't change. So um, we really structure everything around alcohol, tobacco, prescription drugs, and marijuana. And as you know, we're one of the uh, few communities that break vaping out differently. So unfortunately, the federal government lumps vaping in with tobacco when it comes to their numbers. They're just now starting to break it away because they understand it's two different behaviors, which we really need to do. Uh, but we've been breaking that number out for two years now, and that's really important to us to separate it because we do see conventional cigarette use on the decline. But I will give you a heads up that nationally we're starting to see conventional cigarette use go back up because of vaping, which sounds a little counterintuitive. But the way it works is if you're building the brain pathways to nicotine and you vape inside, you smoke outside, and we're starting to see that across all ages, including adults becoming dual, what's called dual use users. So they'll vape inside and smoke outside. So although our conventional cigarette use is still low, especially um, nationally as well, we are go expecting a trend to have that come back up as vaping continues to be the most popular um, substance across most uh, ages. So if you look at under the goals and you see the last, uh, the last bullet point indicates we fulfill a requirement to the DFC grant. Those are the four questions that we have to answer about the four drugs. And again, we just add vaping on. So we actually answer the four questions about five drugs. When, when does the grant expire? We're in year three of five years. Um, our, our fiscal year is actually October 1 to September 30. So it's on a different schedule than the town as well. Mm -hmm. At the end of the fifth year, we're allowed to um, apply for an additional five years. It's not guaranteed. And we have to write the entire grant again. Yeah. It's a continuation grant, it's called. <laughs> then we can actually apply to be a mentor. And are you more likely to get it if you have shown growth or not, or, or improvement or not shown improvement? That's a really great question, uh, you would think, but no. So they're really focused on how you answer the questions. You get scored out of a score of 100. And if you happen to write your grant in the year that everybody does a great job writing the grant, you're less likely. So what they do is they, fu they fund all the 100s, then all the 99s, then all the 98s. Mm. But it's not dependent upon how you um, did with decreasing numbers, that's just how they report back up to the federal to, to indicate to our lawmakers that you need to continue to fund this. So statistically, we have evidence that says if you are a DFC-funded coalition, your community will have less drug use 
among among youth. And that's been that's been consistent actually for quite a while now, which is great. And if, and if I recall, we got this grant because you wrote the grant and you did a really good job. And thank you. We were able to get it, correct? Yes, thank yeah, you. Thank you. I'll probably be the one to write it again. <laughs> but um, you know, one of the things that we did uh, have a challenge with. And we th we actually did get it on the first time. Mm -hmm. um, we scored a 91, I believe, on the first time that we wrote it, and we didn't get it. And um, the w reason we didn't get it is we got marked really low on a question related to data collection. So we've been really focusing on how to partner with the schools, law enforcement, and first responders, and even um, hospitals on how to collect better information there. And on the second time, I believe we scored a 95. So they funded us. So we'll see. Um, so I'll turn your attention to the comparison of past 30-day use. This is, to me, the heart of everything that we're working on. And uh, you can see the changes. Some are minimal. Some are a little bit more significant. Um, definitely concerned about marijuana use among 12th graders. There was a pretty significant increase. Not surprising as we continue to have um, more ways to use marijuana. And the, as we know, the legalization uh, changed the perception of risk or harm related to marijuana nationally we see this as well um, so to be specific marijuana use does not just mean the conventional smoking in fact that's not common anymore uh, we're now seeing this would include edibles as well as uh, vaping which vaping is the number one way in which uh, young adults consume marijuana now the old school rolling of the flower is pretty much out there now not common Um, and I will mention, too, that the last question related to prescription drugs, we do phrase the question, as you guys reviewed it, um, is prescription drugs not prescribed to you? So that number is a little concerning as well. And that could be things like Adderall, um, antidepressants, uppers, everything across the board. We don't ask the kids to separate out what that might be. So continuing along, you'll see the vape use. And again, last year was the first year we separated that out. And um, Mrs. Bailey had a good question about vaping. Uh, last year, vaping non-nicotine, and last year, vaping um, marijuana. So there's technically three options for vaping. You can vape something with nicotine. That would be most popular would be, as you know, the Juul. Uh, this, the second category would be vaping a non-nicotine product, and that would be vaping a juice that they are perceiving to not have nicotine in it or not. Whether it does or not is a different story, but what they're perceiving to not have a nicotine uh, element to it. And the third one, third option being a vaping a marijuana product. And that could be anything from what, what's called a dab pen to uh, even vaping um, shatter or a harder form of, of uh, marijuana. <coughs> What's shatter? Shatter um, is similar. It's a concentrate. So it's similar to butane honey oil. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's the waxy material, but if shatter, it's thinned out a little bit more, so it's it almost looks like glass. Hmm. Colored glass. All of these things we have to keep up on. Yeah, and just as we catch up on one thing, the next things ca came out. Um, you know, one of the things on our radar, not to get off topic, but is, I don't know if you've heard of Kratom. So I just attended a federal conference about in learning about Kratom. We're concerned that that's going to be the next marijuana, and that is a plant-based drug that is in, unlike other drugs in which, depending on how much you take, has different has opposing effects. Uh, don't quote me on this, but if you take a, a small amount of it, it's a sedative. If you take a lot of it, it becomes an upper. It has a change, so it's very difficult for law enforcement to detect. There's no test for it. There's no field test for it, but it's very difficult for law enforcement to say that you're on something and what did you take, and very easy to hide. There's strains of it. And um, similar to CBD, how it's being marketed is the cure-all. It's going to take care of all your problems, from athlete's foot to hair loss and everything in between. So it comes from um, mostly Indonesia, Southeast Asia. So we just uh, attended some seminars with the Drug Enforcement Agency on this about keeping an eye, and I will tell you that I, uh, Detective Lucci and I have purchased it in town legally. It's 100% legal. It's not being regulated at all. So, so always something to keep ahead of. So with the vaping, I mean, obviously yes. this is this is where I've had all the stars on mine where it's like huge increase, especially like the marijuana from 4.8 to 42.5% yes. for seniors. Yeah, I think it must have been underreported last year because that's a really significant increase. Yeah. We did not change the phrase of, phrasing of that, so. Can, can I look at this in a way where I can say, you know, I'm just looking at 
this page that says vape use 2018 to 2019. Mm -hmm. I guess it would apply across the board. But can I say a ninth grader in 2018 is now a 10th grader yes. in 2019 and look at the delta between the two and continue to see that rise and that diagonal? You can look at it that way, yes. correct? Okay. In addition to that, you know, just keep in mind too, as the kids get older, they have access to older people yeah. over 21, and that's something that we look at. In fact, we know the number one source of all substances for young adults is an older person. Mm -hmm. They identify it as an older friend, but it could be a sibling. Um, as, their, as their siblings go off to college, you know, they're likely closer to age when they're 11th and 12th graders. The other thing that we really try to look at is, you know, in North Reading, they have health in 8th, 9th, and 10th grade. 11th and 12th grade, they don't. And so is there something missing there as well in health, in health class? We talked about that at the coalition meeting this morning. And is there a way for the coalition to help with that, to take a, subsidize that in some way? Yeah. Just would be interesting to follow them. Uh, yeah, for right. sure. Yeah. The actual grades to see whether programs have an impact. We actually have three years of data that we're going to, you know, hopefully by the end of five, we'll have a really great snapshot. Yeah. And I, th I think both those numbers are, are important, though, too, just to show that, like, current sixth graders versus yeah. last year's sixth graders also, because when you get into a new school, when you mm -hmm. get into, as you get older, I think you're, my, my theory would be it would, it's going to increase yeah, either way. Yeah. So. And this was the year we saw a significant increase. If you look at um, vaping non-nicotine last year, you know, we had zero vaping marijuana last year, zero at sixth grade. This is the year that we saw a bit of a jump in that one in, for sixth grade, <coughs> which tells me that now our education perhaps should be aimed for that particular substance at fifth grade. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> actually, yes. Do, do you think... Do you think it matters with the high school and middle school being together? Do you think usage at, amongst middle school would be higher if there's a combined high school, middle school, or not? That's a really good question. I, I'm going to speak as my perception of talking to kids mm -hmm. in that the middle schoolers think that vaping is a problem in the high school, but I don't think that they learn about it that way. If I ask middle schoolers who are not using what they think vaping is, they all say water vapor and jewels but that's because they heard about it on social media, not from being here. And I don't see a lot of crossover either. I don't yeah. see them interacting very much. Yeah. Great question though. I think it'd be interesting to compare with a school that is separated yeah. for analytical stuff. I think that's interesting. Um, moving on, uh, student perception of risk or harm. I'll just make the note that typically we see a correlation when students perceive something as being risky, typically a lower use. A um, couple of trends on this is that related to marijuana, we, we're seeing uh, their perception of risk or harm related to marijuana and vaping actually is, is kind of all over the place. Um, and if you ask what those harms are, there really isn't a great answer. So they might know one specific answer, and I'll give you the example of juuling. They might say, oh, it um, does something to your lungs, but they're not thinking about the addiction that goes along with the nicotine. So that's something that's really not perceived as a risk. Same thing with marijuana. They don't perceive marijuana as being an addictive substance. I see that on social media. Too. All the time. The discussion in some Facebook groups. Or yeah. <laughs> yep. Where it's a, a sort of a misunderstanding yeah. of what we're talking about. I couldn't agree with you more. The addiction, of the, mm -hmm. the addictive nature mm -hmm. of, of um, nicotine. Mm -hmm. And so, since I have just have a microphone, I'll just mention a couple of things related to today's marijuana and what we're seeing on social media from messaging from adults, not from kids, mm -hmm. is that they'll say a couple of things like, "Oh, I used it back in the '60s and '70s, and I'm fine." I have said this time and time again. I wish we could rename marijuana. It is marijuana 2.0. It is not the same thing from the 60s and 70s, it has in some cases tripled in strength. And I'm only talking about the flower version. When I start talking about the concentrates, we're up to 99% in some concentrates. That didn't exist in the 60s and 70s, so you cannot compare the two. And potency we know, increased potency, increased effects. The other thing that we know is that if you delay your use, and I don't preach abstinence, I preach delay. If you wait for any substance until after the age of 25, 26, you are more likely to be able to resist a developing addiction. We know that um, for adolescents who use marijuana, one in six become addicted. If you wait until you're after 25, the numbers jump. And you're far more, because your brain weight, your brain is, I, I shouldn't use this word, but your brain is more developed and cooked, right? 
It's the denominator more fully developed. Difference. Pardon? The denominator difference. It's one in 20. Or yes, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Huge difference. And so I get frustrated when I hear parents or adults say to me, oh, I'm, I'm going to let my kids use because I am fine with it. It's not, it's not yesterday's marijuana. And delay, delay, delay. If you want to let your kids use or promote your kids using when they're 25, 26, I'm not going to have anything to say about it because we don't have the science that says marijuana is addictive after that age, but we do it before that age, and it is concerning. So the perception of risk or harm is definitely something that we, we will be working with the health classes on in that area. Um, just two areas of note to the next couple slides um, is the student perception of parent disapproval. And we actually also take, uh, it's not in this report, but we do actually track the student's perception of peer disapproval. And that's the number of kids that say that they, um, their parents would be uh, very upset or upset if they found out they were using those substances. And oftentimes, those numbers do not match what the parents say <laughs> when we do the parent survey. <laughs> So there's another um, disconnect there. Is there any theory to why in 2018 almost all 11th graders thought their parents didn't approve of alcohol and then the next year half of them said they're cool with it? <laughs> no idea. Okay. Very. That's why we need five years more. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Yep. Um, next page is related to self-identifying age first use, and I'm sorry to report that it's trending down. It's from 16 to 15 on average. Um, uh, good thing with tobacco, you're seeing an increase, but I am concerned about a trend down on any age-related question. Uh, the next slide about where students use substances, I get really frustrated again when uh, parents' perception is that their number one place where the kids use is at school, especially when it comes to vaping. <laughs> um, when they tell me, oh, every kid is using in the, in the bathrooms, so why don't you put monitors in there? Well, our data is telling us otherwise, that it's at home uh, or at a friend's house when they are, by the way, unsupervised. So I'm going to go on record about this related to um, vaping monitors in bathrooms, the electronic devices. I'm currently against them, and that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're not proven uh, to be effective, and it doesn't address the addiction part of vaping. If you put an electronic device to monitor vaping in a bathroom, and a kid has a legitimate addiction to that jewel, they're going to relocate. It's not going to stop them from using it. That people who want to do that to solve the problem don't understand that jeweling or vaping is an addiction in many cases, in most cases actually now because of the amount of nicotine in these products. So um, the coalition has taken that stance. They're also very expensive. If I thought that was going to solve the problem, I would invest heavily federal funds from the grant into those to stop the problem, but it, I don't believe it will. Um, again, it's just going to, in my opinion, just relocate the problem. Excuse me, Amy. May I just add here that um, a few of us from the coalition along with the high school assistant principal, attended a Mass Health Co Council conference back in the spring um, on vaping. And I just wanted to echo that Amy's sentiments regarding the monitors in the bathroom were wholeheartedly echoed there for, you know, for those reasons and more. Um, they were very, the, the people, the experts on the board seemed universally opposed to electronic monitoring or video monitoring in, in restrooms. Has that been discussed or in the community? Has anybody heard about suggestions along those lines? Yes. You have? Mm -hmm. it's on the, it's, I've seen it on the connection a couple times, okay. and I've been asked that directly. It's good information to yeah. have a quick perspective. Sure. Please do. Um, I do know that I believe the Vogue Tech is, um, has invested in them, and they have promised to share their results over uh, the next year about if they've been effective, and I'm very open to reading that report and how they, it's played out and if it's been a good ROI for them, but I don't suspect it will be. Well, I think also we have to acknowledge that in some people's minds, a big problem is vaping on sco in school, and maybe they're solving that problem, and they're okay with that, right. but that's not what our goal is. Or right. Um, I get asked all the time about North Reading versus the nation, so you'll see um, some information there for monitoring the future study. Those are 2018 numbers, though, for the federal numbers. Uh, they haven't released the 2019 data, so um, it's a little bit apples to oranges in some ways, but uh, just a year behind. 
So green is where uh, North Reading is ahead. Red is where North Reading is behind. So and you're, you're comparing 2018 to 2019 numbers for North Reading, or you're comparing 2018 to 2018? 18 to 19. Okay. Yeah, because we haven't caught up. But I get asked that question, so that's what I'm saying. It's a little, to be honest, yeah. it's a little apples to oranges. The other thing is, um, to keep in mind that the Nat I'm monitoring the future study only tracks grades eight, ten, and twelve. So that's why you're not seeing the other grades in there. So our evaluator kind of did a nice little graph for us. Um, for 2017, 18, 19, we're just saying that we have three years data. So we are seeing a trend down in alcohol. Al uh, tobacco is a bit all over the space, and again, we are expecting a t trend up in tobacco. Marijuana has gone up, and we believe that that has to do with the legalization and the perception of risk or harm. Prescription drugs is kind of oddly an inverse of the tobacco numbers. It looks a little different. And vape is going down, but um, we didn't track that for uh, 2017. As I mentioned, it, we only started separating that in 2018. And that's a cumulative number. So that's an average across all grades. So I will open up, um, open up to questions, and I'll just mention some of the things that we'll be working on in the upcoming school year. Uh, in the community first, we are going to be offering um, a parenting class called Guiding Good Choices. It's a science-based curricula that promotes parenting strategies to help prevent substance use. To, sorry, Monday, we have, I think, 11 volunteers who are going to become trained in that over the course of two Mondays in the summer. They're very committed. It's very nice of them to do that. And then we'll be offering it free to the community, including babysitting and including dinner. So we're trying to remove all barriers to parents taking that. We'll be promoting it heavily among the elementary and middle schools. Um, we use seven strategies for community change. And that's really interesting. And one thing I want to share with you is that the number one thing that people say to me is, Amy, if you just tell them how bad marijuana is, they'll stop. Adults say this to me every time. They tell me that all the time. And although education is the cheapest, easiest, and most obvious thing that the coalition can do, it's not the most effective. And that's because everybody puts their twist on things. Like we talked about, oh, it's propaganda. Oh, but what about this study? I'm going to find a study that counteracts whatever I'm saying, no matter what I'm speaking about. But I'm happy to tell you the thing that we can do that is most effective is change policy. We're working with the Board of Health a lot on things. So uh, two examples is that North Reading was tobacco 21 before the state was. North Reading banned flavor uh, nicotine products before the state did. And we're working with them on, um, well, we actually, I was at a Board of Health meeting on the day to testify about um, CBD products and the dangers to consumers, both sides, by the way, which we have a whole other story about, um, on the day that the state put a ban in. We're also looking at now, because of restrictions on flavor tobacco products, menthols becoming more popular. Menthols were an exemption to the flavor ban. Why? I don't know. It's still a flavor. And so I'm happy to tell you that the Board of Health is looking at a menthol ban now. So we'll be working on all those things. And um, policy is the most effective thing that we can, we can do. And you know, all that does is really remove it from being in their face so much. It doesn't address the behaviors associated with that or why those things are talking are, are happening. And so I really hope to work with the health teachers and maybe even you know get a little younger. Has anybody heard of the 40 developmental assets by the Search Institute? This is something that I learned about when I was working at the YMCA of Greater Boston. It was something that the Search Institute invested heavily in. It's a checklist that identifies 40 assets. Things like, do you have a parent, an adult in your life that's not re blood related to you that you can go to for advice? Do you um, have a place of worship? These are all things. And it's a list of 40. And the concept is, and science proven, that the more of the 40 things you have, the higher uh, your ability is to risk high-risk behavior. And that includes drugs, sex, uh, all these things, high-risk high behaviors. And so I think that's something that has come back around. I've heard it come up more and more. And I think that's something that the coalition should look into, how we can support that more in the schools. It's a really interesting survey or checklist for adults to take to go through it and go, you know what, I really didn't have that adult in my life, and maybe things did go a little bit different when I was of this age because I didn't have anybody to talk to. Um, they're now starting to look at it. It's correlation related to mental health. So I don't know if you saw the recent study that if um, an LGBT student has one adult that's supportive, they're more likely to not commit suicide or have higher risk, stuff like that. They're starting to look more and more of the mental health component of it, which I'm a big favor of because we always see the tie. What are, the law, what are the laws and regulations around vaping right now? I mean, at what age can people buy in the state and, 
in North Reading? 21. It's across the state, but that's for um, purchasing only. On online, we've talked about this before, is that it's a simple click of the button half the time. Um, and when parents give, you know, Visa gift cards for birthdays or whatever it might be, it, it makes it pretty easy. I get asked all the time if kids are buying it on Amazon. You cannot buy vape products on Amazon, but you can buy vape accessories and vape paraphernalia on Amazon. I don't know if you've heard too, Juul is being brought before Congress to testify, and Massachusetts has several lawsuits against them for, th for their um, targeting of children. children. Yeah. Mara Healy's been a very aggressive, very aggressive and uh, nationwide she's been, I think, the top, top prosecutor on that, which is great. And we write advocacy letters um, quite a bit, and we're, we support that effort. Um, something I think that you had mentioned this morning at the meeting was, I don't know, growing up I had three channels to watch. Now we have cable. Not only that, now you have Hulu, Netflix. And so tobacco can't be advertised on television. And now I believe Jewel's not advertised on television or it's not geared towards children, whereas on Hulu and Netflix and those streamings? It's unregulated. It's unregulated, yeah. so they make it look cute and fun. Yeah, so they're, um, they're getting away with a lot of things related to unregulation, so whereas tobacco has some strict, po alcohol as well, strict policies related to where, when, how, and what they say, it's a free-for-all for vaping. The reason why Jewel is saying that they're not targeting to kids is because they have voluntarily change their um, marketing strategy to say we are all about stopping conventional cigarette use. But be very careful in the wording of that. Yes, if you switch to vaping, you're not using conventional cigarettes, you're just using a different nicotine delivery system. So there, it's a little lot manipulative. They can help you quit cigarettes, but you're never gonna pick up a different nicotine habit. It's switching one for another. So they are able, they're not false advertising. They can say they can't help you with that. And but the CDC is very specific about that. They, if I remember reading this correctly, that in certain situations, vaping is a good um, alternative, alternative to smoking. But first of all, only if you eliminate the smoking entirely, which often doesn't happen. Correct. That's, which is a big Correct. thing, right? Um, but the, it's very specific about when it is a, 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 you know, a reasonable alternative legitimate alternative that will actually help your uh, help outcomes. I'm really glad you brought that up because that is um, their claim to fame is why you should right. switch vape is just right. to stop but using the cancer causing cigarette. Right. It's very narrowly defined Correct. to them. But we don't know in 10 years what that of vaping course. device is going to have done that's, do to you. That's the other part of it. Yes. And we're now, we now, every time a new study comes out, Detective Luch and I are like, give me that. I want to read everything. Right. So now we know, um, and two things that kids actually respond to about education is that um, it's an aerosol. We didn't know that even a couple of years ago, even two years ago, we couldn't describe it. We would say it as a vapor. It's actually an aerosol. And the way I describe that to kids is you wouldn't go into a room, spray a can of Axe, walk into it and go, <gasps> <laughs> that's what it is. We now finally have that science. The other thing is that Juul specifically do release heavy, metal, heavy metals. Right. And as the kids go through science class, they understand what that is. And some of those like lead, is being released. That's, uh, as we learned from Pam Vath at, at the Board of Health today, it's a neurotoxin. Right. So, yeah, you might not get lung disease, but you might have a different problem. We, it's just been around too short of a time for us to have that problem. Right. And I will t I'll mention as well, uh, related to regulations that have been very interesting, is that two things that affected combustible cigarette use to go down. One was the long-term studies of negative health risks. We don't have that for vaping. The second thing was taxation. We made it too expensive. We don't have that for vaping either. It's not taxed the same. So it's actually cheaper, unless you have a really high habit, it's actually cheaper to vape. It certainly <coughs> must be cheaper per gram or whatever it is of mm -hmm. nicotine delivered. And I'll give you an example is that a four pack of Juul pods right now is about $17. And one pod is the equivalent nicotine wise of a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So it's like four packs of cigarettes for $17, which you know you could never buy now, yeah, because of taxation. So we aren't taxing it the same way. And so we're also not getting the revenue on the taxation to put back into prevention either on that. So <coughs> Massachusetts is a progressive state on that, so that's good. Okay, thank you. Questions, concerns, comments? 
I have um, something oh, to give Sorry. to you. Oh, yes. Yep. So I would like to invite everybody. Um, next Tuesday, August 6th, is National Night Out, where we do a lot of prevention work. We do a lot of education. We also eat a lot. It's a free, <laughs> free barbecue that the police department um, cooks for us. But we have a, a big focus this year on suicide prevention. So our clinician, Laura Miranda, will be there to um, provide resources. But also, if somebody just wants to come and say, could I take something for a neighbor? Touch a truck, so there's something for all ages. Uh, seniors are allowed to get a free ride from the senior center. We want everybody to come. And then I have something for Mr. Bernard, which I don't think he knows. So this year, the coalition, not the grant, but the coalition celebrated five years, our anniversary. And we had a little celebration, but Mr. Bernard was caught up in a meeting. So I have a certificate of recognition for the North Reading schools um, in partnering us for the past five years because we literally would not have gotten the grant if it weren't for our relationship with the public schools. So I wanted to give that to you. Excellent. Yeah, thank right. you. Can I take a picture? Oh, yeah. You want to give me one? Okay. Get in there. Yeah, Marcy, get so in Marcy's there. So Marcy's our coalition chair. I don't know if I mentioned that, but Marcy signed it. You want to get in the picture? I'll take a picture with you, Marcy. Very nice. I should. I think uh, as well because you know five years of work it's it's a long way to change attitudes and behaviors and uh, thank you Mr. Bernard it's, ma it's made a difference as yep. he retires we're happy to have uh, Dr. Bailey but we're going to be missing him so. thank you for all you guys are doing yes thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, I would I, I would just go Jean, who's on the, on the committee and she's got great attendance yeah <laughs> I was going to say we meet on Tuesday morning at, yes. at 10 o'clock once a month usually the last oh, Tuesday okay of the month. Um, our next meeting is August 27th at 10 a.m. in room 14 Town Hall. But you're always welcome to any meeting. I know it's a tough time for some folks, but if you ever want to drop in and just see what we do, you find yourself with a free Tuesday morning and we happen to be meeting, please come by. And any sort of trends and you want some special training just for this committee, uh, Detective Lucci and I are happy to come in, you know, as we get more and more educated about this Cray Tom to stay ahead of the game. Any trends in vaping, marijuana, we're happy to come by and bring you um, more information and do kind of a hands-on training. Yes. Where, where is the meeting? At 10 it's at town where? hall. Um, it's a town hall. Yeah, I'm going to send out an email. Room 14. Yeah. Room 14, just for this. Usually we meet at the NRPD community room, but there's a conflict just for August. So for that date, we're moving meeting at town hall. Well, and, and I would just, I mean, I would like to thank the coalition for the work that they do. Um, Marcy, I know is involved in everything, but Amy, I can't say enough. I mean, like you are one of the most impressive people that ever comes before us. I mean. You always make BC. you well. It is because you're in BC. <laughs> That's probably what it is. But no, I mean, like you, you are so. I mean, you make me feel so old. Like I'm so disconnected from so many things. And again, your presentation is just <laughs> phenomenal. And I mean, every time you come, I just learn a million things. So thank you. Thank for, you. And we're experts yeah. at none of this. And trying to stay ahead of everything is a race. <clears throat> but thank you for your support because we. It's very important to us. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Chairman, if I might real quick. Of course. You mentioned about the night out. It would be a great opportunity for the school committee. To, I, I, I was there last year, and, and just to, just to, for us to be visible as we, talk, as we talked about community engagement uh, earlier today. So just to show great. up for an hour. Or I think I'm on vacation. vacation that week, I am, though. too. Yeah. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. That's always yeah. the first week of August. I'll be there. Thanks for representing us. Yeah, I, I will represent. We have our leadership team yeah. retreat. It's, uh, it's, con it's conflicted the last three years. Oh. Yeah. Okay. For rain. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So I guess we have no continuing business, so we'll go on to new business. So the October 7th town meeting warrant articles. Are there any warrant articles that we want to propose? Mr. Bernard, Mr. Connolly, do you have anything that you can think of? I do not know. The only question I had was about the special education, but that's a, that's a financial one. And are we doing all financial in June, trying to maybe put another 100000 away next year as well? Yeah, yeah I don't yeah, that wouldn't be come up June. again. That would be Correct. the spirit, I Until think. June, yeah. Correct. So I don't think there's anything else. I don't anticipate the need to. Anybody else have any warrant articles that you'd like to propose? Yes, sir. 
Okay. Moving on, the appointment of the North Shore, North Shore Education Consortium Board of Directors. The recommendation, Mr. Bernard, you want to speak about that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Maybe it's the same for both of the next two items, the North yep. Shore Consortium and the Senior Board of Directors. So the committee, um, the, the district is a, is a member of those two special education collaboratives, and in the past, um, the school committee has appointed the superintendent to serve as the district's representative to the board of directors at each collaborative. Um, I'm happy to continue to serve. I know Dr. Daly would be happy to continue to serve once he um, assumes the superintendency in January. So what I have is a recommendation in um, each of these items is to uh, appoint me for um, August of 2019 through December of 2019 and then Dr. Daly from January 20 through uh, June, uh, excuse me, July 2020. And I think my, my only question would be, does that make more sense than if putting Dr. Daly for the whole year? I mean, probably. Uh, I think there's a transition period. I'm going to bring okay. Dr. Daly. I had a SEAM collaborative meeting this morning. Um, I, I informed the director that I was going to start to bring him in the fall as a transition meeting, but okay. I, think, I think it makes sense for the superintendent to have the voting authority. And you, and you have been... You've been the leader of some of these groups in the past, haven't you? Are you are you currently this I was year? The, I was the financial representative to the um, SEAM collaborative. Okay. Are you currently a, a, a group I'm not, in like that? No, okay. it rotates. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Rich? Okay, so should we do these? We should probably do these separately. I think, yep. I think that makes sense, yep. yes. So if we have a vote on to appoint. I'll make a motion to appoint. Um, Mr. Bernard from August 2019 to December 2019, and then uh, Dr. Daly when he takes over superintendency from January 2020 to July 2020 as the lead for the North Shore Consortium of Board of Directors. All second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And on the seam? I'll make a motion to appoint Mr. Bernard from August 2019 to December 2019, and then Dr. Daly as he takes his new position from January 2020 to July 2020 um, for the SEAM Collaborative Board of Directors. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Routine matters. We have our meeting notes. Anyone like to uh, jump in at meeting notes? Uh, sure, I'll make a motion to accept the Jul June 3rd executive session minutes as recorded. Second. Okay, any discussion? Anybody see any errors in that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? I make a motion to accept the open session <coughs> minutes of June 3rd as written. Second. Not 3019. Not 3019. <laughs> um, what is it? On the agenda. 30, oh. typo. Um, okay, any discussion on any discussion on the open session? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I make a motion to accept the open session slash town meeting of June 10 as written. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. And lastly, I make a motion to accept the open session minutes of June 17, 2019 as written. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. We must have some great recorders here to, <laughs> with no errors in any of these. <laughs> okay, budget update, Mr. Connolly. Great, thank you. So this evening in your packet is the final fiscal year 2019 budget uh, report. I'm happy to announce <coughs> that we uh, experienced a smooth and successful closeout of fiscal year 2019. We finished the final Accounts payable warrant um, just a, about a week and a half or so ago, um, and everything went went very smooth. Um, as projected, personnel costs remained within budgeted ranges, and we were able to identify some surplus funds and some salary accounts, insurance, and utility accounts that all worked to assist with our ability to prepay special education tuition payments, and we were able to once again exceed the amount that was forecasted during the FY20 budget development process. 
Um, and we were able to meet the carryover uh, projected balances in transportation and athletic revolving accounts as well um, to meet our fiscal year 2020 sort of targeted, targeted amount. So that process went very, very smooth. The food service program closed out the month of June. I recently completed the final quarterly report and balance uh, sheet for um, the food service program's financial activity for fiscal year 2019. They were able to earn a small net profit in the month of June, and um, I, once again, I'm happy to report that we've had our second consecutive break-even or profitable uh, year in the food service program, earning a little over uh, more than $2,500 uh, for, for the year. Um, certainly pleased with the, the program's performance over the status, over the course of the 2019-20, uh, I'm sorry, 18-19 school year. The average daily mail participation was up on average across the district at all five schools by about 7.5%. Um, adult sales were up um, by almost a total of 20% this school year, which to me showed some of the new initiatives with the additions of the salad bar at the middle school and the high school um, certainly made a difference. We added the salad bar this year at the middle school. Um, and we will be adding a breakfast program at all elementary schools next year. So I think the bachelor um, elementary school program, which is sort of a pilot elementary breakfast program this past school year, uh, really grew throughout the year. Um, it started out very small. It was really an a la carte type program, and we were able to actually recoup some um, increased federal reimbursement meals by selling more type A breakfast meals over the final quarter of the, the year, which made a big difference. So we're hoping to experience that same success at all three elementary schools. So um, I am pleased that all, all five schools will have a breakfast program and an option for students um, next, next school year. That's been a long-range initiative that will be fulfilled next, next school year. Mike, just a um, real quick question. Yeah. Um, so the monies that you make as a profit, does that go back into like kitchen uh, equipment, stuff of that nature? So, all the, the monies stay within the food service uh, revolving account, um, and any remaining balance or carryover balance certainly goes to support. Um, there's a lot of capital needs and um, up, updates that need to happen on an ongoing basis. We actually are making some um, improvements to some of the equipment. Uh, Hood School serving line is getting some, some, some upgrades, This much needed upgrades this, this school year, this summer. Um, and then we have a preventative maintenance program with a provider that will come and kind of refurbish um, not only the refrigeration equipment, but the, the kitchen equipment as well. So that, that all, it all goes back to the program and, and serves to um, um, certainly help, help the needs of that program. Okay, thank you. Um, Again, on the payroll side of the report, um, really nothing significant to report. Um, you know, certainly final payroll expenses were very close to our budgeted amounts. So despite some unanticipated costs that we did incur um, more early on this year in the areas of sort of some, some HVAC needs and plumbing needs, um, you know, we made it through sort of a, a, cold, a cold winter. Um, we were certainly able to achieve um, year-end carryover funds we had planned on during the fiscal year 2020 budget process, and I'm certainly pleased with how the 2019 fiscal year closed out. I do think we are in solid financial standing as we um, begin the, the next fiscal year, fiscal year 20. Do you remember what the winter was? Was it average in terms of, I don't know, what do they call them, degree days? Degree or? days, yeah, it was about, the, the heating degree days were about average, uh, it, I think maybe it was somewhat of a cold winter. It might have been slightly above average in terms of heating heating degree yeah. days, but the, the snow uh, was down. Yeah. Um, so certainly things like overtime costs and snow removal costs was was lower than it had been in the past. But I think certainly our gas consumption was a little bit higher. I noticed the heating degree days went later into the season than we had seen. Um, but you know, overall, we I think we we did pretty well con controlling costs and so forth this year, and mitigating some some unforeseen that occurred on the, on the facility side. So, um, any other questions? So, with the um, with the circuit breaker, with the extraordinary relief that we we received for special education, is that included in the numbers here? 
So that is that that those funding certainly flows into the uh, a, you know, reimbursement revolving account. I just didn't know if it had been, um, if it had been received and it's part of it now. It's all received, okay. and it certainly you know has a an impact on these numbers. Um, but that those the funding that we anticipated would be there and would, would roll over is in that account that would be made available yep. in fiscal 20 is there. So the original um, forecasted budget uh, forecasted amount. For the prepayments, with that part of was that part of the budget? So we had forecasted an amount during the process. Of that the is in the budgeted amount already. Correct. And that's the ab amount above that. Correct. Correct. So yeah. So we we have forecast about a hundred thousand yeah. um, dollars, which we were able to exceed. We actually paid quite honestly. We paid about yeah. three hundred thousand. So that that additional um, amount that we've exceeded, which we've been able to do over the last few years, will right now. Uh, you know, certainly yeah. work to be a level of flexibility and to deal with another yeah. layer of us to deal with sort of unforeseen yeah. costs. We'll say pending uh, uh, the inevitable last minute. Please. Yep. So and, again, and again, but that, but that, I mean, it's needed because the base is going to go up for next year because of the reason yep. we got extraordinary <coughs> relief is because there were so the expenses expenses were so much higher than anticipated this year. Correct. So our base goes up for next year. Yep. So it's. It's just a higher base, so it's not right. Yeah. So the baseline will be higher, um, and you know, I'm from what I'm hearing at the state level, um, we should see that account circuit breaker program funded pretty close to a fully funded amount, yep. close to 75 percent, which would be great. Our fourth quarter payment, as it typically is, was about 15 to 20 thousand dollars higher than. Um, because they had some available f monies left, and that, that does happen. That sometimes that fourth quarter payment is a little bit higher. So on June 30th, they got a little bit more money um, in that account, which is helpful. All these things are sort of really helpful um, for dealing with what, quite honestly, is the biggest kind of vol volatile area of our, our budget. Um, so we want to. Do I do all the gifts and donation things together now? So Michael, do you want to start with your memo on yeah FY19 gifts and donations? We'll do all That'd be great. Yeah. So I have a couple of supplemental uh, budget update reports. One is the the memorandum that we've been doing over the last four or five years that details on a spreadsheet all of the both cash donations and in kind donations that we received from the start of the fiscal year. So this would be July one, two thousand eighteen through June thirtieth, two thousand nineteen. The spreadsheet does include the final quarter of the in-kind donations from the five parent organizations or associations at the five schools, which we were able to uh, reconcile and, and balance those quarterly in-kind spreadsheets um, in July. So that those amounts that would be uh, essentially recognized this evening is included on the, the, the full year report as well. But I'm happy to report that we received and accepted a little over $213,000 over the course of this fiscal year, to $213,481.40. So as you can see by the, the long, you know, almost two and a half page list of donations dating back to last July, um, really helped support things like additional expenses for ath athletic teams, fitness equipment, transportation expenses for class field trips, various classroom supplies, um, technology and makerspace supplies and equipment, drama and musical production expenses, expenses and support of events like Parent University, for example, and many other enrichment activities across the district. So that's just kind of a few of um, some of the, ver the, the various items that these um, ver donations have worked to support. We certainly present during the budget process that the annual average is about 175,000 or so of, of these gifts and donations. We've exceeded that this year, but we're at 213. So um, you know, last year we were at 196,000. I went back and looked. So we certainly continue to greatly appreciate the support of the the various donors, which is a combination of the the, the parent groups, the support groups, private donate do donors, parents, and various parents helping with some field trips and. Um, you know some some local businesses and so forth make it some in kind donations. So um, certainly very very appreciative of those. And then um, so maybe, maybe before I mean yeah. I, I just think it's worth noting. I mean I think we we we, we thank people every week, but it, 
I think we, we understand on the committee here that we are very fortunate in this community that we're in because we have very high taxes to begin with. We understand that. Um, we don't you know, have a lot of businesses in this community. We have some that are very good to us. Um, we have fees for programs. And then on top of all of that, it's the same people in this community over and over that are giving that, you know, they, they're paying the taxes and they're paying the fees for their kids and they're still supporting above and beyond that. You know, more than $200,000 is just, you know, we're very, very fortunate and we'd love not to have to have all those fees. We'd love not to have to have this, but at the same point in time, I don't think anybody up here wants to cut services or cut the, what we're delivering to the students. And so that only is possible because of what the uh, people in this community do. So. Great, well said. Thank you. Um, um, okay, we have four memos from you, so pick your next one. Yeah, so I mean, I know the. I'll kind of skip past the the individual gifts and donations noted for this evening because I think those need to have a, a motion and can kind of go with the other gifts yep. when we get to that agenda item that are listed for this evening as well. But I did I, I did want to talk about the student activity quarter four report. So as is our practice, um, we've been presenting quarterly um, as we've sort of reconciled um, our bank account balances for this, the five student activity accounts at each school. So this report reflects activities for the final quarter of fiscal year 2019, which ex essentially represents the time period of April 1st through June 30th. Um, but we recently completed our, our work on the student activity accounts for this past fiscal year. And, certified our bank balances um, just these past, this past week. So what's reflected on the report, as has been our practice over the last couple of years, is uh, the, the five schools' student activity balances, um, which you can uh, see there, which are now reconciled to the, the bank accounts. And then because of the high school and the middle school have the various sub-accounts, um, we've broken down the active student activity clubs um, with active account balances um, on the subsequent pages. You can sort of certainly take a, take a look at those, but I think <clears throat> I think an adherence to our policy and, and so forth, I think these these accounts continue to be in, in, in good shape. So I'll just take Mike, questions. just a quick question for you. Um, so I see 2019 as a class has a very small amount of money in because they've, they've finished up, they spent it, and they've done those things. What happens to what's left of that money now that those kids are gone? So what they would do is typically, um, I think that probably reflects the balance after they've probably made a donation back to the class, which is in they support. They made a, a gift uh, donation. In support of a sign. And that's basically typical for the, whatever the remainder is. Well, the, 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 any well, Michael can answer your question about yeah. what the balance, but he, he works with the student um, offices of the class to a, right. transfer that money, but I I'll let him. Yeah, so that, the, our policy allows them um, about 90 days to create a, a class reunion account. So their, their class offices do that, and then we would make out, once they've done that, they, sh they give us the uh, account information, and this balance gets made out as for deposit only into that account. I see. And it's given uh, to the class president and class treasurer. Gotcha. And it's usually, it kind of usually happens sometimes in, around Thanksgiving break, quite honestly, by the time they come when they're in. home from school. Yeah. And then um, they'll deposit into that account. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, yeah. any other questions? Okay, do you want to do, do bids and donation or do staffing next? What, whatever your pleasure is. I, I'd say we just keep going with bids and donations. Money, we'll money, back money staff. talks, right? That's, so. that's all right. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from April to June 2019 from the North Reading High School Parents Association, totaling 12, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, $1,285.55. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations of the above mm -hmm. list of school uh, for the above list, list of school activities and expenses from April to June of 2019 from the North Reading Middle School Parents Association, totaling five thousand forty-five dollars and twenty-nine cents. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Unanimous. <clears throat> I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from April to June 2019 from the J.T. Hood Elementary School Parents Association, totaling 
totaling $9,942.23. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee votes to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from April to June 2019 from the E.E. E. Little Elementary School Parents Association, totaling $10,746.99. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from April to June of 2019 from the L.D. Batchelder Elementary School Parents Organization, totaling $16,716.20. Um, sorry, second. <clears throat> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And Michael, were these, this is all part of the 213000 It is, yeah. Everything this evening, these plus the ones that, the next ones, the next ones as well. Okay. Okay. Be part of it. Perfect. I keep going. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $200 from various donors from friends and family of Charles E. Jones for the Charles E. Jones Educator Excellence Award in memory of Charles E. Jones, former middle school assistant principal, in the amounts of Fred and Jan Janice Lomas for $100 and Jeffrey and Patricia Bemis for $100. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $174 from Barry and Firma Kipnis to support the high school boys basketball team. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude supplies and materials valued at $218.65 from Moynihan Lumber to support Christopher Nearing's Eagle Scout project to build a school storage shed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Um, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $325 from various donors from friends and family of Charles E. Jones for the Charles E. Jones Educator Excellence Award in memory of Charles E. Jones, former middle school assistant principal. Donations by Gail Poplaski, Peter and Roberta Shaw, Leo and Joanne Mastranzi, Daniel and Priscilla Hurley, William and Sharon Guvea. Oh, second. Yeah, that's impressive. I'm not going to lie, Rich. All those in Just favor. Assuming I got it Aye. right. You did. You did. You did. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed. Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $449.85 from DonorsChoose.org uh, and Judith Chasen to support Je Jana Como's music class. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed. Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $1,038.65 from the Batchelder Elementary School Parents Association to support Batchelder School wish list items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,107.50 from the North Reading Music Boosters to support music in the park bus transportation fees. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. And I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $4,000 from the North Reading Middle School Parents Association to be used at the principal's discretion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $10,000 from Jim and Paula DeRosiers to support the Drama Masters Department. Second. So on discussion on this one, this is the sort of donation that I think we should invite them in I think to actually recognize them. They wrote a nice letter uh, mm -hmm. afterwards about it as well. And so I don't know what, what people think, but maybe it's a when, great example. And maybe when we go in, even in September, we could maybe invite them to a school committee meeting just mm -hmm. to thank them. Mm -hmm. so. It's a, quite a gesture. Yes. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the donation? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And that is it. Well done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Bernard. <laughs> I'll take it for me. <laughs> it was for you. <laughs> I, we're we're going to put it in the thank you letter. I'll, I'll schedule okay, it for our September meeting. Thank you. That's what we were just talking about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we send every donation we get. Michael generates a thank you letter, personalized. 
And I think this is the kind of thing, I think in that letter we can identify a date for a school committee member for people to, to come in and be recognized and thanked by you publicly. So that's, I think, we'll, that's yeah, kind of the mechanism we'll, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. use to, to do that. <clears throat> so um, as you might expect, um, this is, you know, this is, uh, we're in the height of our hiring season for the new school year. So I have a number of new staff to, to uh, introduce to you this evening. Um, starting at the Batchelder School, we have um, a new um, half-time, a .5 FTE kindergarten teacher in Karen Baxt. Um, Sarah Fitzpatrick, um, a graduate of uh, North Reading Public Schools, uh, will be a grade four teacher in a long-term substitute position for the year. Jennifer Peterson is a new grade one teacher. She had previously been employed in the district, but is now a permanent employee. Stacy Pawinski has been hired as a .6 long-term substitute for the, um, for the school year as an art teacher at the Batchelder School. At the Hood School, um, Allie Hughes has been hired as a grade three teacher. And Sarah Leakweg has been hired as a .5 FTE kindergarten teacher. At the Little School, Ashley Zinchuk, who also had been um, employed in the district as a paraprofessional, is now going to be a special education teacher in the pre-K program. At the Middle School, Cynthia Friedman has been hired as a science teacher. Jason Perella has been hired as a special education teacher. We welcome Allison Stewart as a science teacher and Susan Sussman as a new digital learning and computer science teacher, again, all at the middle school. I'm happy to tell you that Mr. Hain will continue for one more year as the interim assistant principal at, um, at the high school. He's done a very nice job for us this past year and we're happy to have him back um, for one more school year. And then for the district hires, we have Paul Lavagian, who has been hired as a new digital learning specialist. He'll be working um, across the district at all five schools and will also be teaching a class or two at the high school. Lauren Hinchin has been hired as an elementary speech language pathologist and Daniel Muse has been hired as an elementary instrumental <coughs> music teacher. We do still have a number of um, available positions that we're working to, to fill, but I have every confidence that we'll have a full complement of staff for the opening of schools. So welcome to all of our, our new staff thus far. Mm -hmm. I have one question. When we were doing yes. the budget, we were talking about, I think it was as part of the middle school transition, there was a position that we were hoping somebody might want to go from point in the five. the foreign language, yes. Point five, did that person Point five went to go? point nine, um, I believe. Yeah, wasn't it? Okay. point nine. Yeah. Okay. Then, yep. Thank you. Sure. Well, the committee, just the committee up yeah. <coughs> um, Just kind of going back to it's the, if you don't mind, Scott. Yes, of course. Um, to the um, donations, would it be nice to have, like, maybe the schools come in or address them where we're at their schools for their PAs? Yeah. Oh, when you do the, uh, yeah. the visiting meetings? Yeah, uh, just because the 4,000 that... As opposed to like a random um, identification of a day, do it at the school at yeah. which the donation was received? I think that's a nice idea, yeah. I, I mean, because yeah. we travel to the different schools yeah. anyway. Well, I think she's talking about the, the, about like the, 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 the PA, the, the parent the association. Parent association. We reckon as a parent association. Oh, oh, yeah. we, oh, as we've done, the, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about the donors. Well... They are. You're, you're saying as the way. parents associations being the yeah. on the on the site meeting that we have at that school, bring that group in. As a yeah. thank you. Yeah. 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 I mean, they just donated yep. you know, four thousand to. Well, again, if you look at the total, total. sixteen thousand, ten thousand. Yeah. Oh, really? That's just. If a you look at the total, the total from each. Yeah, element. that's just. Oh, a, I know. That's just yeah. one yeah. quarter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we had. I think we had years ago asked the parents association rep to send a representative at at, at yep. those meetings when they held the school. So we can start that again this year. Yeah, I think the first one. I know there's January, I don't have the schedule right in front of me, but yes, I think we can. I think that's a nice idea. All right, subcommittee updates. NORCAM Board of Directors, I am not the representative anymore, so I did not go, and I think Mr. McGowan may have. Oh, it's yes, Mr. McGowan. I, I regret to re report that I uh, did not attend the Board of Directors meeting in uh, June, I, uh, so I don't really have an update. Um, policy subcommittee, you have an update on that? Mr. McGowan or Mr. Mr. Papavasa? Pa Papa sure, Vassar. yeah. We, uh, we continue to add commas where necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's always um, good to have an he's not, English. He's not joking. The, uh, <laughs> we did do a lot of comma work today. Um, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the m most major changes we, we looked at today were that a series of different policies all indicated a number of criteria uh, for 
advancement for non-certified personnel in their salary schedule, which is not in keeping, the policy is not in keeping with our practice nor with the direction in which we, we typically like to go. So um, we had uh, adapted that language to match our current practice, which is that uh, there are certain expected things teachers will do and they'll be evaluated at the, or not teachers, sorry, uh, non-certified personnel will do and they'll be evaluated at the uh, stipulated intervals in their contracts and that won't have anything to do with their salaries per se. And you'll see some of those changes uh, coming forward uh, in a future meeting. Uh, we, yeah, those were really good. So we were Please. through section G. Yep. Yeah. So we're making good progress. Um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, I think probably at the August meeting I'll have a few things to bring forward to the full committee that, that uh, Mr. McGowan, Mr. Papavasilio and I decided we should, you know, they may not necessarily be in the act of a first reading, right. but they might be revisions. Um, I think they, that's more of that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, more I in think the way there was one or two that we might yeah, have that, might that, be, were, that we'll need to actually have votes on. Others right. are, we made changes to language to clarify and just probably want to bring them forward to you guys to sh tell you about so that you can object if you think that we did a bad job of that, but that don't really require. Or word, or word smith it further, but not necessarily warrant a first or right. second yeah, reading. because we're not changing the, the meaning. The substance of the part. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I rarely have any changes to these things, so. Right, yeah, you're very quiet about these things. The committee's moving very quickly. The contract. Just saying. Contract <laughs> subcommittee, I will say, we also <laughs> kind of have had some discussions about the administrator contracts and just looking at those because in, in, in anticipation of hiring the superintendent and also there's a number of those contracts that are negotiated, being negotiated in the next year, next six months. Um, subcommittee schedule, following meetings are all at the superintendent conference room. Finance planning team, August 22nd at 8.15 a.m. Athletic subcommittee, September 18th at 12.30 p.m. Fine arts subcommittee, September 25th at 2.30 p.m. Policy subcommittee, September 25th at 3.30 p.m. And then the NORCAM board of directors will meet at the NORCAM office on September 26th at 7 p.m. I promise to be there. Oh, there we go. It's the promise on the record. <laughs> administrative, at least one person from NORCAM is here watching. Exactly. So. I, the, fair enough. Yeah. Um, administrative report. Mr. Bernard. So, Mr. Chairman, and, and for the members of the committee, I included in, um, I guess this kind of overlaps into correspondence, but I'll, I'll speak to you about two letters that, um, that I received complimenting three members of our staff. At the high school, um, Mrs. Maggie Miller and Mrs. Amy Sin are no two foreign language teachers who were complimented by the uh, Massachusetts Foreign Language Association for their support of a poster contest that was hosted by that um, professional organization. And I thought, I thought it was, number one, a very nice letter, and number two, I think a very, um, very pleasing thing for me to receive, um, knowing that the, the group took the time to, to send a personal letter to me acknowledging the efforts of those two teachers. So I wanted to share that with you. And then the second one is regarding um, Mr. Owens, Mr. Ben Owens, who is, um, has recently completed his first year in the district as, um, as our band director and a teacher of music. And he, he has you know, done a very, very nice job in, it as, in his own right um, as a teacher here. Um, but I thought his expanding his work um, with the Northeast uh, Massachusetts Music Educators Association and to have received a letter of, of commendation for the effort that he put forth this year and looking forward to his joining the group again next year was worthy of, of sharing with you. So um, I'll just say Mr. Owen's name keeps coming up. He's setting that bar pretty high for he, uh, himself going he has, forward. He, has had a, he had a very good first year, yeah. that's for sure. And I, I <coughs> obviously I know all three of them very well and they're well-deserved letters. You know, it's nice to see others recognize their talents and acknowledge them. So, um, again, I thought it was nice to share with you. The only thing that wasn't in here, which I know that uh, Dr. Daly and I think you were also very proud of, was there was a New York Times article about Google Glass. In which yes, there was. Recognized. Yeah, you there was. Speak to that quickly, too. Yeah, so there, there, we, we have been um, partnering, partnering with some other districts locally on a... Um, how would I describe it? An, um, an instructional assist, an assistive technology tool, uh, particularly for children with autism. Google Glass, as you said, and there was, we were profiled in a in a recent New York Times article. It was on Twitter. I think I Patrick put it out, and then I, I retweeted that. And um, he was mentioned specifically as um, having brought that um, that device to. Um, to North Reading, um, but he also has a personal use with it with his own son um, in his district, and um, it was a, it was a pretty it was a pretty nice feather in our cap. And to see the device actually used with students, it's a it's a kind of a um, it's a device that assists them in making visual eye contact, direct eye contact, 
with people, um, which often can be difficult. Um, and it just, it, 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 it has a pretty significant um, positive impact on, on the child's um, social skills and then ultimately their educational skills too because they're, you know, it's a focus enhancement, so. Yeah, I think it also, um, their ability to understand, um, you know, facial expressions yeah. and what that comes across as, whereas normally they might not be able to recognize it, but I think it helps assist mm -hmm. with that so that they can respond in a social situation accordingly. Yeah. It's a fascinating. It's sort of, it's absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, yeah, and, and the way it's came, come about. I mean, <clears throat> and certainly that's not why they developed Google Glass. They thought mm -hmm. it would, they hoped it would be a great consumer product, and it maybe maybe didn't turn out to be that. But this is a had a very more beneficial exactly right impact. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also just great that we have people in the in our district that are finding the new technologies and finding applicable ways to use them, mm -hmm. and being at the forefront of that. So yep, for sure, we would appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Yes. Any other correspondence? Or? I have no other correspondence. <laughs> okay. Future business, August 26, goals workshop. I actually think we can probably cancel that now. Mm -hmm. so August 26, we have a meeting um, at 6.30 p.m. here. August 27th, new teacher orientation luncheon at 12.30, if people can make that. Can I speak to that? Yes, of course. For, for newer members particularly, but it, it's, this is not something you need to be at, but you're welcome to be at if your schedule allows. It's, a, it's one of the two days of our new teacher orientation that we host every year um, that um, you can feel free to come and join for lunch and mingle with the group if you wish and if your schedule allows. And that, that uh, is similar for the, the next item, the September 3rd opening day meeting, although I would say that this one is more typical um, for attendance by the school committee if you're able to be there and I know that sometimes can pose a problem so don't don't feel badly about that but sorry um, which one is more typical September 3rd. the September 3rd the opening day meeting I mean everyone I, everyone made it last year but I will typically announce so. but it's not it's not it's not the case every year it, it's some you know it's, just, it's a hard time of the day and I know that if you if you're some of us have if you're in the day. field, it's, yeah. you're probably on a you're probably in a similar meeting in a different role, right? It'd be a so. great excuse to skip mine. <laughs> and the chairman usually, well, I, as a remark, that, that was the other that was the other brief, comment I was going to make. Is brief that, remark. To well, the, the staff. Yeah, that was the other comment I was going to make. Is Mrs. Im, Imbriano made very clear with to me that if I took over chair, she wanted to be able to give this address <laughs> again. Oh. <laughs> she says she very much different appreciates. Speech? Would it be she a different? She very much appreciates. <laughs> She very much appreciates being able to take that uh, time to address everyone. So, no, I think I'll defer to like a minute long. His is like I, I think it's. <laughs> I do think it's a nice gesture of, you know, of the committee to. Of course, the, the staff don't always interact with you. I mean, the principals do, and certain staff do when you visit schools. But I think if there's an opportunity for them to to see you and hear from the chairman. I, I do think yeah, it sends a nice message. I'm very shy with a mic usually, so. <laughs> Um, and September 9th at 6.30 p.m., <laughs> regular meeting back here as well. So that is our agenda. Uh, I can have a motion to, term, adjourn. to adjourn. That's the word. <laughs> yep, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous.